there was a famous modern musician that recently had been quoted as saying the following. I used to go to Catholic Mass with my friends, and I viewed the whole business as a lot of very enthralling hocus-pocus. There's this guy nailed to a cross, dripping blood, and everyone's blaming themselves for the man's torment. But I said to myself, forget it. I had no hand in that evil. I, I have no sin. I have no original sin. There's no blood of any sacred saint on my hands. I pass on all of this weird stuff. And the truth is, is that there's many that feel the same way. There was a whole article just written yesterday of a group of churches that were trying to get guys like me to reconsider ever using or thinking or saying anything about the blood of Christ because it scares people away. Well, the Apostle Paul has this to say about all of that. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. And when Paul says that word boast there, it, it literally can be translated as to glory in, to trust in, to rejoice in, to revel in, to live for. Talk about contrasting statements about the cross and the blood of Christ. One calls it evil, one calls it irrelevant, one calls it scary to mention to people, the other calls it wonderful. One wants nothing to do with the cross, the other wants nothing to do with anything else but the cross. One sees it as the ultimate and some sort of cruel ritual, the other as an ultimate in love. Many people claim to have a relationship with God, but unfortunately they deny that Jesus died on a cross as a ransom for sin. You see, there's people that argue, my God is too loving to pour out infinite suffering on anyone for sin. There's no such thing as hell. There's no such thing as eternal death away from God. Everyone goes to heaven. Well, then why, why the cross? Why the historical reality of Jesus dying for us in such an awful way? What, what did it cost then, this kind of love to really love us and embrace us? What, what did Jesus endure to receive us? Well, the typical answer in our world today is, well, I don't think that's necessary. One pastor writes it this way, How ironic, in our effort to make God more loving as people, we have made God less loving. His love, in the end, according to people today, needed to take no action. We're just sentimental about it. It's not love. The worship of God like this will be impersonal. It'll be maybe cognitive, maybe have some ethics to it, but there'll be no joy. No joyful self-abandonment, no humble boldness, no constant sense of wonder we would not sing to such a being 
love so amazing, love so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. If there was not some sort of sacrificial love. You see, to talk about God loving us, independent of the cross, makes the love of God just kind of a mushy Valentine's type of thing. Just mere sentiment. You know, who cares then? In the midst of the misery that we go through, debt, grief, loss, rejection, sickness, fear, depression, what does it matter if God loves me? The Christian author writes, the only sacrificial love that really can move us to change is that of the Savior. He says this, power affects behavior. He says, love affects the heart, and nothing on earth so moves the heart as a sacrificial suffering love. That is why the perfect expression of God's love for us is the dying figure of Jesus pleading for someone to moisten his burning lips. Here's the deal. Where others can find the cross appalling, the Christian cannot imagine God or love without it. The Christian's hope and joy and life is bound to the cross. The blood of Jesus shed on that cross. We, we read about it this evening. This, this Bible is full of references to how blood covers sin. And specifically, moving from the Old Testament to the New Testament, references to the Savior's blood include that the reality that He literally bled on the cross, but more significantly, that He bled and He died for sinners. The blood of Christ has the power to atone for an infinite number of sins. Sins committed by an infinite number of people through the ages and all whose faith rests in that blood. That that blood actually saves. The, the reality of the blood of Christ at the, as the means of atonement for sin, as you heard tonight, has its origin in the Mosaic Law. And yes, once a year, the priest was to make an offering of the blood of animals on the altar of the temple for the sins of the people. And in Hebrews 9.22, it says, In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Hebrews 9, look it up. But this was a blood offering, in this case, that was limited in its effectiveness back then, which is why it had to be offered again and again. But it was a foreshadowing of the once and for all sacrifice of Jesus. Offered on the cross, as it says in Hebrews 7. And once that sacrifice was made, there was no longer a need for the blood of bulls and goats. You see, the blood of Christ is really the basis of the new covenant. On the night before he went to the cross, Jesus offered the cup of wine that we will be taking here in just a moment. And he said, this cup is the new covenant. 
in my blood, which is poured out for you. And the pouring of that wine in the cup symbolized the blood of Christ, which would be poured out for all who would ever believe in him. And when he shed his blood on the cross, he did away with the old covenant requirement for the continual sacrifice of animals. Because their blood was not sufficient to cover the sins of the people, except on a temporary basis, right? Well, and also because sin against a holy and infinite God requires a holy and infinite sacrifice. And I, and I love what it says in Hebrews 10, verses 3 and 4. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year by year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. That's what it says. And while the blood of bulls and goats are reminders of sin, 1 Peter 1.19 says something amazing. It says, the precious blood of Christ. Precious. It's worth everything. It's worth our life. He gave it freely for us. A lamb without blemish or defect. Paid in full the debt of sin we owe to God and could never pay ourselves. And we need no further sacrifices for sin. That's what's amazing. Jesus said on the cross, it is is finished. He said that as he was dying and he meant just that. The entire work of redemption was completed forever. Hebrews 9.12 Having obtained eternal redemption. You see, not only does the blood of Christ redeem believers for, of sin, from sin and eternal punishment, it does something amazing to us today in how we live. In Hebrews 9, 14, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, Cleanse your conscience from dead works. You move from dead works, and what does it say there at the end of that? It says, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serving the living God. Complete change. Everything about us changes. We're new, we're transformed, we're changed. The blood of Christ cleanses us, a pure conscience, so that we may serve the living God. See, that, that means that not only are we now free from having to offer sacrifices which are useless to obtain salvation, but we are free from having to rely on worthless and unproductive works in this life of the flesh to please God. You cannot do anything to get there. Because the blood of Christ has redeemed us, we are now new creations in Christ, as it says in 2 Corinthians. And His blood has freed us. Freed us from sin to serve the living God. You know what I want to do? 
I, I, I want to glorify him. I want to live a life celebrating what the blood of Christ has done. Oh yeah, we're going to talk about the resurrection on Sunday. Don't miss it. But we need to talk about the blood. The blood of redemption. There is a reason we take communion. There is a reason for the Lord's Supper. Where Jesus takes that Passover lamb moment and that Passover meal and says, hey guys, all along, that was giving you a picture of me. By his blood, we are freed from sin to serve the living God, to glorify him. And you know what? We get to enjoy him forever. Amen? That's what makes it a good Friday. That's what it makes, that's why it's a good Friday. But we need to remember the cost, remember the pain, remember the sacrifice, remember all of the things that were going on that day. Could, can you just imagine what those moments were like? The morning rush, the, the rising heat, crowded roads, all of the shuffling feet. Suddenly there's a chill. There's a hammer ringing from the hill. Violence. Violent scenes, angry words. People say he's getting what he deserves. Crushed and marred. He's our middle man. Oh, mercy flows from his hands. I see heaven touching earth. Every drop of that blood, matchless work. Redeeming love, what gain, what loss. When you think about that crimson dust beneath the cross. The day was then dark, pain so real, tender flesh. Torn by steel. But history turns around. Because holy blood is falling down. I, I see heaven touching earth. Every drop of matchless worth. Redeeming love. What gain, what loss. Oh, that crimson dust beneath the cross. Holy, 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 Jesus, Lamb of God. Yes, I see heaven touching earth. Every drop of matchless worth. That redeeming love, what gain, what loss on this good Friday let us remember that crimson dust beneath the cross. And that is why we're going to take communion together right now. We're going to take the opportunity to remember the blood of Christ and what he did for us on the cross. And if you did not grab communion